Hi guys, it's now early August and we are filming the next episode of Cooking with Our Part. Today I'm going to look into Martino's Catalan Miraus or Miraus or however you want to pronounce it. A Miraus is a half cooked dish and we'll come to that in a bit why it's called half cooked. Um, it involves making a, something like a stew with a half roast chicken and the stew involves broth. So I'm going to start off by actually making the broth, which is what you see here. We have the chicken wings, which I have under a cloth because we're outdoors. Um, I have my mise en place, which today contains salt, of course, long pepper, bay leaf from the garden, and cloves. I'm making a modern broth because I have not really seen any period recipes for broth. The only um, difference here that I'm see that I'm making is that I'm using long pepper. We'll talk about the bay leaf we, from my own garden. I have a bay tree. If you have the climate for it, it's well worth having because the difference in flavor is unreal um, and in smell. Is that what I'm smelling now? Yes. It's a very fra it's very fragrant. If you know bay leaf. Um, this is just more complex, fresher. Um, oh yes, d delicious. As all the TV chefs say, delicious. <laughs> I have problems doing that. It's such a case way of self advertising. Anyway, at the moment I've lit the barbecue chimney. Um, it's going over there. Once that is hot, I'm going to put it here into my box barbecue. I'm gonna brown off the wings so we get a Maillard reaction and more complex flavors. Then I'm gonna put on the broth on the barbecue, bring it to a boil and then let it simmer for several hours. As you know, it's a broth. Um, meanwhile, while I wait for the fire to light, I'm gonna prepare my veg that go in there. And the thing about that I've learned from pros about when you make a broth or a sauce and you're not actually going to use your veg there is no point in being pernickety you don't need to clean it you know don't uh, well this be clean but you don't need to peel it make it look pretty it's not going anywhere you're not going to see it so i could do whole rounds but they have a fatal tendency to roll off so that's why i do half rounds What are you doing with the vegetables? Well, what are you doing there? Fundamentally, I'm just coarsely chopping them um, so they fit in the pot and have a bit of additional surface area so they leach out the flavor a little bit more. These days we make um, broth with root vegetables and a few herbs and spices for added flavor. I honestly don't know what they did in period. It may have been just water and the meat. Um, thing is, Every biggish kitchen had always had a pot of broth on the go because when you cut meat and take a bone out, you don't throw it away, you throw it in the pot. Um, it's also the big misunderstanding, I think, about cooking in history, especially in early history. Everybody goes, they roasted meat over the fire. No, they didn't. They really did not. That's mm -hmm. a waste of calories at an epic scale because all the fat drips into the fire. So, so you're saving the fat by having the broth, you're saving the fat, is that exactly, right? Exactly, yeah, by boiling. Um, if you go to the Outdoors Museum in Rexford, um, they actually have an old cooking, a, a rebuilt cooking pit. And they sometimes make cook, cook a hog in there. And you do that by putting the hog in, into the little pond that that is and heating stones in the fire and throwing the stones in there to boil the meat. So you boil before you roast? No, you don't roast. Well, no, you, you don't roast. Roasting is for very much for celebratory occasions. Um, there is somewhere in the Bible, Mart quoted that a while ago, um, where it specifically says to roast the meat, to make it clear that the, to do the unusual thing of roasting the meat. Uh, I need to ask Mart where that was, but it's, it's a classic misunderstanding when people go, oh, people have roasted meat since ancient times and we never had a problem. 
when we talk about the ill effects of fat dripping into the fire and the carcinogenous um, things you get from there. No, the regular way of preparing meat, even for nomads like the Mongols, was called was boiling, not roasting. Get a few snaps now. That's um, okay, so I'm gonna grill them on this, um, brown them off. And the browning of meat uh, triggers the so-called Maillard reaction, M-A-L-L-A-R-D, um, after the discoverer, I presume, which is caramelization of the sugars and some of the things. It adds flavor, it adds depth of flavor. Um, so when you make a good broth, you always want to do that. I don't think it's pure technique. I'm doing it to have a nicer result. I'm seeing a lot of people um, putting pineapple on a barbecue. Is that the same idea? Yes. That's exactly that. A pineapple in the barbecue caramelizes the sugars in the pineapple. Yes, Thomas, I know. <laughs> um, that was my cat going meow with me from the tree. Um, So I'm fundamentally making a modern broth. I mean, everything would have ended up in the stock pot. The gnawed off bones the, that were roasted. Leftover meat that you couldn't do anything else with, throw it in the, in the pot. Um, and I mean, there is a restaurant somewhere in France that has the same pot on the go, on the fire since 1790 something. They actually had a problem because after slightly over 100 years, that pot was history. 150 years, sometime in the 20th century, they had to, to maintain their record. Replace the pot without taking the whole assembly of the fire. There was a major operation, as I recall. Um, but they did it. They must, if we look up the Guinness Book of Records, we might be able to find it. Bernard, can you tell me about that jug you've got there? So I bought that in York over 10 years ago. Um, there's a medieval house in York that's being run as its own business. Um, and they do some period stuff and some not so period stuff. But this is a recreation of, I believe, a 15th, 13th century jug. And I saw it for 18 pounds and went, yeah, okay, you're coming with. Where can I get one? I have no idea. I'll, I look up the link to the medieval house if they're still around and we'll stick it on downstairs in the links. The fire is ready and in my little barbecue. So I'm gonna brown off the wings. One of the things I learned from cooking shows is to use tongs for everything. How, how I ever lived without them, I don't know. Would medieval people have used tongs? No, probably not. Because this is steel. I've never seen a picture. I think they cook like you do at home, cook like you do at home with spoons and stuff. I still use spoons, I don't use these for stirring. But for turning things like here in the pan, but then again, individual frying of short fried pieces like a steak or a cutlet or whatever is not very medieval. Well, do they just do the entire cow or pig in one go? No, but um, bigger cuts or again stew or spit roast. Um, I mean, Martino does everything on a spit. Martino, being the cheeky sort he is, also has recipes for doing eggs on a spit. How? You do an egg on a spit? You show us that, will you? <laughs> <laughs> if I figure, fi ever figured out myself, but fundamentally what he does is he says, make sure you have a hot spit and stick it through the egg quickly. Through the shells, of course, in and out. You've got to do that. <laughs> we do it, uh, and you do don't rehearse it, just do it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I didn't rehearse this because, I mean, this is me trying out a recipe on camera, and I think actually, I hope the viewers will like this. I hope you, the viewers, will like this. Um, because this is, I hesitate to say research. I think research is a term that's much overused when I read up on something. These days I say I do research. No, I don't. I read up on something. Doing research means creating knowledge. 
just figuring out what somebody else has said is not research. So Google isn't research? No. <laughs> Google is li fundamentally library work. It's what you did like 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You try to find something out, you go to the library, go to the index and start looking. That's what you do with Googling. Whereas research is? Research is going to original sources and starting from there. Um, because if you do, and creating new knowledge. I mean, if I look up something in an encyclopedia, like Wikipedia, then I'm relying on, on work and on research that other people have done. I'm not doing research. Oh, is, this, is there anything special about this chicken? Yes, actually, good, thank, thank you. Um, this is a slow-grown chicken. Um, that's the same, same kind that we're gonna use for the recipe later on. So this is not quite a hen, um, which is an old chicken that's very flavorful, but it's not like a modern roasting chicken that's quick grown um, and doesn't have all that much flavor. This is slow grown, this is much denser and has a lot more flavor. What has this chicken eaten? Does it matter? Um, a lot of grass, but also chicken feed. Um, but they just didn't give any growth hormones, didn't feed them up quickly. Those chickens are a fair bit older than your regular broiler. Do you get this locally? Yes, that is like Slaney Bend, which is as Gandalf's crow flies, maybe three kilometers that away. So very few food miles then? Yes. Does that matter? Food miles, is that a consideration for medieval? I prefer to buy local, yes, for a lot of different reasons. A, I think my biggest one is really that I can establish a relationship with the producer more than anything else. I can talk with the producer, I can make friends with the producer, I can have a personal relationship. And the other reasons are more important on a global scale, I would agree that, but they're, they're not really what makes me do this. They make me feel happy about doing this. But at the end of the day, I will always um, swerve towards quality above anything else. Is that what makes you happy about buying locally? Yes. This is why I'm buying local because the quality is fantastic. What are you doing now? Well, as we said, I'm browning these off. So we get a bit of a Maillard reaction going and a bit of flavor, or maybe a bit too much of a Maillard reaction. People seem to be eating things that are burnt to black lately. Is that a thing? Is that a good I thing? I haven't or? noticed. Um, but then I live in a bubble, as we all do these days. But I hadn't actually noticed that. I mean, this is clearly burnt, of course, as we can see. Um, I need to pay a bit more attention here. So you're not burning it deliberately? No. What I'm aiming for is more like this. Let's see. And it's too much flame there. Is flame a big thing in medieval cookery or is that another mm. isn't that another stereotype? I don't think it is. I mean, they wouldn't have used charcoal much more than simply firewood. Um, so rather than having a bed of coals like we do here, go away, behave. Um, they'd use, um, they'd be cooking on a hearth and you make a fire there and of course you get coals. But I think also a lot of it was actually with flame against the pot. The pot then being on a tripod or suspended on the rack. Um, I mean, actually this palace, which was built in the early 1900s, originally had 
the kit an old-fashioned Irish kitchen, including the mechanic fan that you could crank to get the fire going. Um, yeah. How many people are you cooking for? I mean, we're going to use fundamentally to take this out eventually, strain it off. Um, the dish itself is a, is a small, small chicken, 1.3 kilos fully. Um, so I'd say with rice, that's a two-person meal. I'm not going to do a lot of veg. I'm going to do rice with it. Is rice medieval? Yes, very. White rice isn't though. Um, it's one of the things that is interesting to find out that medieval Europe didn't know how to husk grain. That's why, for instance, white flour is so highly prized and so rare, because white flour was not done by husking the wheat and then grinding it. It was done by sieving the ground flour, brown flour repeatedly, which of course is endless amounts of work. You said but earlier about um, um, peasants not being treated. Did, would your staff have done that for you? Who would have done? Yes, that of course jobs. Would, would, would be the staff doing it for you, but I mean, the amount of labor makes it expensive. Um, but, I mean, I remember as a child seeing on TV the Asians throwing their rice into the air to let the husk blow off. And Asia knew how to do that since time immemorial. But Europe learned this after the Middle Ages. To my utter amazement. We are blending the chicken stock that I made um, with toasted bread, toasted almonds and four egg yolks which are coming up now although these are also quite nice Are the Fiona eggs just that bit better tasting? They're, they're very good they taste very well, they are, in, they hold better together. There is this picture that Fiona has on her Facebook page of the flat sunny side up equity dome of egg yolk. It actually looks very cozy and warm on set. <laughs> and I'm just gonna tell anyone who's interested, it is not. But for some reason, all the orange lights, yes. making it look positively Christmassy. Can I break your understanding or your perception of a scene in the Lord of the Rings? Go on. In the Lord of the Rings, they have this struggle going up, trying to get up the mountains through Caradhras, in the deep snow, freezing their butts off. In a, on a sound stage in Auckland, knee deep in styrofoam at 30 degrees. I'm glad for them. I wouldn't wish it on anyone being cold. Right, now let's see whether I can somehow do this with the cable. I'm going to have to pull on this a little. Add a little, little bit more liquid. How does that smell? Is that all the spices? No, then there's no spices in there. Oh, we're just making almond milk thickened okay. with egg yolk, or mixed with egg yolk, not thickened yet. Did you taste any of those almonds after they came out? No, I oh. tasted them a while ago in, a, in, a, in an experiment. And you're not tempted to taste this, or would the raw egg put you off uh, tasting? No, I, that, that I'm not concerned about, but I actually will. In... Oh yes, even without spices, just with the chicken stock, oh yes. Very good. And now we strain this.
making my spice mix, um, which I'm only partly grinding really, um, I crumbled the cinnamon sticks rather than grinding them. I'm gonna pull Are you hitting March? Let's throw this in and then disassemble the chicken and bring the whole thing together. For this kind of work, poultry shears is really, really useful. Mm. We haven't talked, we have mentioned that this chicken is from a lady called Fiona. And I think at this point in time it might be useful to show the video that we did with her. So, Radu, take that away and then we'll continue. So, why don't you tell us how you raise your chickens? Absolutely. Um, well, thanks, Bernard. And I'm, we always love hearing about how our chickens are different because we do go out of our way to make them different, which is hence why you found us and you're still here, which is lovely. Um, we, we use a Hubbard bird, which is a heritage breed bird, um, so it's one of the older fashioned ones. Uh, and whilst we bring them into the shed for the first couple of days of their life, um, up to four weeks, no more than four weeks, usually after a week. Hi. What we yes. yes, it is very much a family business. Yeah, well, and that is the nice thing about chickens is that they're fairly safe, so actually mm. the family can get involved. Yeah. We, what we do is we take the birds, day-old chicks, we buy those in, and we put them in the shed, and just in, until they're, as soon as they're old enough and as soon as the weather's warm enough, so we only do it seasonally because mm. they have to be outside, otherwise they don't get that texture that you yeah. really enjoy. The shed for a couple of, two weeks, I ideally is a nice time to take them out. Um, they're happy and they're healthy and then we move them out into the, into the paddock, quite literally, and we'll show you what that is about. We put them into um, what, you call a chicken, what we call a chicken trailer, um, and what that means is that they never ever go inside. So mm. if there's any two minutes of daylight in the day, then we, as soon as, it, as soon as the sun comes up, they're getting that daylight, they're getting mm. the bone density, they're getting the flavour. And we bring them out and then they're out here all of the time, right up until mm. nine or ten weeks. Um, depending, or eight or nine weeks, depending on what we've got going on and when we can get them to the factory. And yes, the sheep in the background, they're getting all the biodiversity that the soil has and the different nutrients that the different animals bring and promote within the soil. Um, and I think that's why, Bernard, it does, it ends up being quite dense. I mean, when you gave me that small chick, I went, I went okay, that's the one. No, that's not a one kilo chicken. And actually, yeah, they, everyone says that. Yeah, because they're quite small, but they're quite heavy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. a one point three kilo chicken, I yes. think. I mean, I came into this from a health point of view. Mm -hmm. The medieval side, I'm just delighted with because I think it's great fun. Nice. And we would use, a, we'd make a great broth. We'd make a great roast chicken, and the brown meat mm. is brown, and the white meat is white. Yes. So, and and it was flavor. funny how we came to this because I remember coming out here for the eggs. Yes, you did. Yep. And um, asked you whether I could have hens at some point. Yes, yes. For the flavour, and went, yeah, but we also have these chickens that are very slowly raised. And went, okay. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes. And, it, and actually, you're so right. It was 
it was madness because no one really understood as quickly as you did what's different about these guys. So they're, they're nine weeks old and they just take on board what they want to take on board when they take it on board. Yeah, so if I show you how we move them. Yeah. Um, so Um, so they instinctively know to move forward. They had to train them a little bit in the beginning um, and they're going for the new grass and then we just put all of this back in. Yeah, and they really like the new grass. Yeah, they do. Um, it's hilarious how quickly they learn to love the new grass. Well, and even quite often we end up with a, um, a greener patch because it's been fertilised by the chicken manure. You can see the strips going through the paddock. Now the sheep are in here at the moment, so you can't see those strips, but you would see the strips. And that's, you know, that's nice for us. Okay, so I'm taking these apart. Um, I've taken the legs off and cut them in half. This is the last one. And of course, that one didn't go through in one. Um, so, breast pieces. For the record, by the way, Avril and I just talked about how much we have to con control ourselves not to start eating this. Okay, let me have one last little look in. So, it's done, it's dished up. We have a bit of rice. I've poured the sauce through a sieve again because there was a lot of spices in it that I'm not sure you want to eat. So let's do this out. Can you give me little small bits, <laughs> please? If I can find oh. any. How about this? Yeah. 